This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, welcome back. It is another fine week in October. It's actually starting to cool off a little bit. I was surprised. I think there might have even been a little bit of rain here in California. Crazy. Normally it's been over 100 degrees, which just means that it's going to be like a bajillion degrees for Halloween, I'm sure. Uh, this has 68 campaigns in this episode for Tuesday. That's insane. That means for me to get this down to a level that is reasonable, I'm going to have to maybe cut it to like 20 seconds tops per campaign. So um, if it seems like I'm rushed, it's because I'm trying to get out of here on time. <laughs> and uh, make it so you don't have to spend all week listening to the same episode. So with that in mind, I hope everybody's having a great time. Um, lots of bad news on the economy front, worldwide, shortages, things like that. Uh, this will continue and it will affect the board game space. So most of the things you see and continuing through next year will probably have fewer and fewer large plastic pieces um, or they're going to cost more. So shipping, also whenever there's a, a fuel shortage, goes up significantly. I shipped a pair of pants to one town over. And uh, it was because they were bought it on eBay. And they paid $32 for the pants. And eBay charged them $28 for the shipping. So that's what we're kind of talking about. It's going to be expensive. Just keep it in mind, people were asking questions in different th places, and it's like, why is it so expensive to do all this stuff? Because apparently that message hasn't gotten out to folks that uh, the future is predictable, and these business folks have to predict it, and they have to, they can't run out of money and then not be able to ship it, so they have to estimate higher, which sets a higher speculation amount, which means that um, everything goes up around it, it causes hyperinflation as that speculation continues. And that is something that is going to be continuing uh, to increase throughout the year. It is no single person's fault. It is just a thing that happens after a big recession, which is kind of what happened globally uh, from last year. And uh, inflation is just something that is difficult to combat right after that. People just jump out and start spending or there's a big you know, rush to get more people to work, so they wa uh, wages increase. And uh, some type of stimulus things increase the money supply. Whenever the money supply goes up, inflation goes up. It's called the Solo Growth Model, S-O-L-O-W-E. If you want to look it up, it's uh, one of those uh, macroeconomics principles you learn in first year of business school. If uh, you want to get a jump on it or you skipped those classes. It's just how it goes, and... Um, the only thing you can do about it is either save, make better decisions, or and just kind of ride it out. With that in mind, let's get to the games. Only get the ones that you really like. And like I say, I'll try to just say one thing and then jump off. It's, it has nothing to do with the quality of the game. It just is me trying to shut up <laughs> and get the uh, episode done with quickly so that you don't have to sit through my two, three minute explanations of everything. First up, we have uh, Gartenbrau, and it is one of those games that takes place in a uh, flower bed. Basically, it is competitive flower uh, stuff. So you have water, you've got seeds, and there's a lot of games that are in this space. Um, and they, they've been fairly popular uh, as of you know recently because they're very non-combative. And uh, yeah, give it a shot if you're interested in it. Check it out on Tabletop Ink Simulator also. Then just as popular as garden stuff is bird watching. So this is bird watcher the game. And it has nothing to do with the other bird watching games like Wingspan that are out there. But uh, it follows suit that it's got the good artwork and you can uh, try and identify all these different types of birds. And it's a, you know, it's a game. It's got some competition to go with it. But uh, at the same time, you have a nice relaxing thing that you don't have to uh, kill, kill, kill for. So, you know, there's that kind of stuff about it. Uh, scrolling down real quick to see if it has any tabletop simulator stuff. All these people, how to play. 
blah, 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 shipping. Don't see anything about tabletop simulator to play first. So if you want to check it out, you're going to have to look at the rule book, and that's the best you got. And then you have Micro Medusa, a path building game from the snakes on Medusa's head. So it's kind of a neat idea, just building the monster and moving your way through. And 10 bucks is not a bad amount. Uh, card drafting, so you're going to be drafting the tiles that you want to use. It looks like there's some combat type stuff. Have your own Clash of the Titans. Make it happen. It's too cheap to have it on tabletop simulator or uh, print and play options because it's only 10 bucks. So check it out if you like it. If you don't, then uh, save your money. Then we have a business of tr uh, rail and trading and buying and selling and all that kind of stuff. Union Station, Travis T. Hills Union Station. Uh, you got hexes, and I think the idea here is you're basically running the railroad uh, in and out. Um, not a lot of artwork to go with this. It is very much like a stock market-esque uh, type of game where uh, everything is very simple, um, easy to track, all that kind of thing. But maybe you'll find some 3D printable pieces that uh, will scratch your itch if you want better looking components. Then Lord Raccoon Games has Taverns and Dragons on GameFound that you can check out. That is the current game playing, two to five players. Has all these little fantasy dragon meeples and uh, some good looking artwork. But on the younger end, uh, not so grim dark looking, uh, more fancy uh, folks. These guys would look great in any game if you wanted to use these meeples to swap them out in different places. You hardly ever see dragon meeples, so you know that kind of thing is neat. Uh, nice artwork going on. What kind of game is it? It's a fantasy game with all these crazy uh, fantasy trope archetypes and all that kind of stuff. It's got your goblins. It's got your dragons. It's uh, it's a light version of Dungeons and Dragons for uh, competitive two to five players to check out. Um, you got your dice rolling. You're in the city. You're getting minions. You're all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, maybe it's even an easier version of uh, Gloomhaven if you wanted to just talk about uh, what's going on. You can check out Jesse's interview here, uh, or Tantrum House, on uh, their videos to see if it's the type of thing you like. They gave it out to a lot of people, they didn't give it to me, so you're just going to have to go to somebody else to, to find out how it plays. There are a lot of car games out there this time. This is a revival of a 1986 game, Thunder Road Vendetta, making tons of money. However, they set it at half a million dollars, so that's going to be kind of hard good luck to restoration games for this um a lot of these revivals have had difficulty actually making it to the end of the the line like there was an evil ones and all that uh hopefully restoration is going to be able to make it work uh it's a very simple looking game though i don't know why it has to be set at five hundred thousand dollars maybe that's just the cost of plastic and what they're worried about for a 50 dollars game that means it has to sell a whole lot of units um, maps are pretty simple. Um, I hope it's fun. I, ha you know, obviously they're not sending me copies, so, uh, I can't really tell you too much about it, but, uh, if you check it out, some folks that are on it, uh, who's on the team, I don't recognize any of the names, but yeah, give it a go. See if you're into this type of racing, you love that Roger Corman style. And then you have Coyote Peterson's Wild Adventure. Uh, he's one of those guys that uh, is on the internet getting bit by things, I think, and telling you how much it hurts. Uh, anytime you get bit by something, it should hurt. <laughs> That's just how biting works. Um, but yeah, uh, not a lot of information here as far as the game itself and how it's played. That is a, uh, a problem. Also, you know, it's it's nice if you want the box to have the person, if you think the person is the selling point. But, um, you know, you don't need to just cop out at a photograph. Maybe show some animals or something that's supposed to happen in there. I mean, I've only seen this guy's clips because I watch other nature channels and they get used in it. So, um, yeah, unless he's out there specifically on his own channel with millions of viewers trying to get people to buy the game and showing them how the game works, the people that run this game need to be on top of it. Because right now, they're just kind of showing components a lot of the same picture over and over. Come on, man. Be be, the, be a good marketer. And here's a weird one. Um, this is the board game Robot, the Olem. So 
Uh, they tried a lot of these types of things in the 80s, and this one costs $266 for the early bird version and 324 for the regular. So I guess this is like a Simon or some other fancy business that is supposed to help you uh, make the games more fun, not necessarily being your com opponent, but being like a facilitator of the game. Um, if you are a new adopter, you're one of those types of people, then maybe you would check this out. There were supposed to be a whole lot of uh, mechanizations and, and uh, automations and things like that done on virtual tabletops uh, brought to uh, various screens uh, over the last two years. Everything got put on hold because of the, the economic downturn. I don't know if this is the way to go, but if you can reprogram it to play with your dog, worth a mint. Then we have some Japanese games. Uh, they're always some kind of strange thing. Dandelions and Psychic Pizza Deliverers. Um, they're, they're always some kind of weird. Uh, it's hard to say whether they'll, they'll be this maybe some type of roll and write game. Um... I don't see anything that you blow on, which is kind of the function of dandelions. So, I don't know, kind of throws me off on that. Even if you're just blowing the dice down, it would make more sense. And then the psychic pizza delivery, uh, what is this, like a battleship maybe? And that's what makes it psychic, and you have to tell where the other players are. I uh, think it's a cute aesthetic, but as far as how the thing moves and all that kind of stuff... Um, it's not probably for me, but it might be for you. If you're interested in these types of Japanese games, give them a shot. Then we have Perpetuity Grave Descent. They almost made where they would be at pretty much the, the guaranteed shot of making their goal. Uh, they're very close to it. If it's instead of a 35-35-30, uh, but a 30-30-40 split, then uh, for the beginning, middle, and end of, of the campaign, then they might pull it off. Um, Solo mode, co-op, space stuff, and um, I guess you get to play different factions. There are a couple of uh, things that are non-meeples. You can get ships and stuff like that. So that kind of thing is neat. Um, aliens um, that are meeples you can use in a lot of different places. So 90 bucks though. It is expensive. And is this part of a deluxe mode? Um, yeah, so this 90 bucks gets you, I guess, these extra figures that are either 3D printed or sculpted out. So, uh, yeah, if they didn't have those, I think that they would have enough people to already fund if they didn't have those extra um, specialized plastic models. Moving on to Bully Boss, two to four players, cooperative. Um, they're asking for a lot of money for this. Components-wise, there's no reason for that. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, people need to rejigger their, their costs and figure out where things should, uh, should actually be so they can get made. Um, something about angry people, uh, mainly pawns, that kind of stuff. 50 bucks. Or is it 50 euros? 50 euros. Okay. So, it's not the worst expensive thing. Um, oh, here we go. So, apparently it's about having a bad boss, and that's why they've included these political figures uh, to go along with it. Uh, good luck with them. It's, it's I just don't think anyone wants anything political anymore. Then we have uh, board game Z and Z zombies and zilches. Um, if it's already in tabletop games, the all the board game stuff is a little redundant in the title. But hey, it's Japan; they do things differently over there. Um, yeah, it seems to be like a build your own zombie kind of thing with multiple pieces for the cards and some type of uh, survival system. So if you're into the aesthetic, it's got its own neat kind of thing. Uh, it's not available uh, on anything, but you can check out the cards. You can watch them play it, see if it seems fun. Then we have like a 3D Tetris, which is block. So it looks like you're going to be building in all of the dimensions. 
So at $23,000, the pieces would be customized. Uh, they might all be plastic and the amount of colors and things are specialized that they'd have to get. Uh, it's also in South Africa and Norway. So I don't know how much the costs are to get plastic and everything made in those places. That might be justifying the costs. So it looks like you have a puzzle and you're going to be doing the best you can to generate um, the blocks and come up with something. Play it on Tabletop Simulator. Uh, you might just fall in love with it. Here's one that comes with a mobile app because it is a deck battle game and uh, a lot of times the mobile apps at least make it so you can play the game if you don't have someone else to battle against so that was a good idea but it's just called heroes and villains um, so that is a little on the generic side uh, might be hard to differentiate itself that way um, there are what's that one sentinels of the multiverse and some other ones that are kind of in the space already uh, definitely uh, hour of need Street Masters, all that kind of stuff. So if you need more of that type of content and you can get the minis and things to go with it, maybe you will enjoy this type. Uh, Hour of Need did not do very well. Sentinels of the Multiverse already had a big um, following to go with it when it had its latest version. So it's just a tough space to be in if you're not DC Marvel. Even if you're Valiant, which is one of the, the third or fourth sized ones, it's a difficult uh, space to break into even though it might be a lot of fun. And uh, I don't know, maybe this should have been in the card games section, but uh, if you needed something to take care of your cards, then uh, here is a acrylic or plexiglass display case that might help with that. Um, $30,000, I don't know how many people need this type of stuff. I would assume if they have these kind of special cards, they either come graded already in some type of enclosure or I mean, they've been around for so long that they might just already have the stuff and not need more in the market. Then we have Mind Joke, which is deck crafting in a horror setting. Uh, again, $30,000, hard to come by. If it's just cards, that's just paper. So they can get printed in a lot of places. It doesn't have to be necessarily China. And these are like dark fantasy looking things. But I'm not really seeing anything to make me think horrific. We've already gone through all the English side of stuff. Um, the art is dark, but it's not necessarily gory. Uh, so uh, if it's not horrific enough, I would understand when there are other options available. Something that has been scaring people for decades, centuries, etc. Mythical beings. So this is a bunch of stuff that has been taken from various parts of the world and you are going to be running the creatures against each other and the artwork is a little bit looking like stuff you'd find in the Voynich manuscript so it's not super terrible whatever but if you like the there be dragons here aesthetic then uh, this might go for you um, lots of weird things I don't know what's going on here uh, this just looks like a lady that's been around too long um, gravity was not kind to her, uh, and, you know, some dragons and other weird things. It's just a lot going on, um, not necessarily seeing a lot of how to play this type of game, um, so really, it is more along the lines of, I think, if you wanted something with a lot of mythologies in it from various cultures, that might be the selling point. I am doing horribly at keeping these short. $45,000 is not going to happen. So we'll take a quick look. You get some basic Game Crafter style pieces for this Card Z zombie card game. Has your basic um, weaponry and that kind of stuff. There is so much going on already in the zombie space uh, that I maybe they're just assuming that uh, there's all this money available. And there isn't. Um, one to two players, the ones that are doing successful, like Zombicide, you can get a lot more players if you wanted to do it and have big games and all that. So rather than looking like something that just came from a bunch of different screenshots from zombie horror movies, some of them very low budget, uh, it just doesn't look different enough for the space because a lot of people have already bought these types of games. 
Then we have Drunken Adventures, 3 to 12 players, so it must be some type of party game. And it looks like it has some uh, fantastical elements, including horse and mouse people, leprechauns. I can think of some dirty jokes that go with that. Uh, basically, it's a drinking game, and uh, you're going to move up the lagger, or the logger logger, uh, and figure out what you're going to do. Uh, yeah, so if you need a new drinking game, you can download the how to play, check it out from there. I don't think there would be any tabletop simulator stuff in there. The art does look interesting, like old um, political cartoons and stuff you might have found in a competitor to Mad Magazine early on. So, Then we have turn-based strategies for two to four players in Forgotten Treasure. This looks like it is a pirate-based game with uh, 30 minutes on the clock. You will be competing um, to reveal various treasures. You can get it in uh, Tabletopia and Print and Play, full rule book, all that kind of stuff. So you can test it out if you'd like. There are some little upgraded versions and things like that. Uh, it's just, there's not a lot of piracy necessarily seen, so maybe it's more of an archaeology type game. Then because people like cats, these are kooky cats. Um, yeah, they're fairly simple. Oh, I was like, why is a dinosaur in there? Because the cat is in a dinosaur costume. Various types of cats. Four cat people that like cat things. Um, yeah. So, if you have a cat, a lot of people do, then uh, maybe you, you need to have a card that lets you put your nose through it so you can make a little cat face. Um, in which case, you're set here. And then, so this is one of those educational games, Monumental Consequence. Uh, it says about finding out if art is worth dying for. So um, maybe it's like an educational thing that you'll discuss the historical relevance of various pieces of art. And I don't know, discuss afterwards. It's supposed to be for training seminars and that kind of thing. There is a time and place for all of these. Um, good luck to them. I just don't know how many people are that into art that they need a training seminar over it, unless they're taking art history classes. Then big money on Paint the Roses, a game about Alice in Wonderland. Remember when she goes to meet the queen and all that? She is painting, or they are painting the roses. Uh, Wonderland is not owned by Disney, so then other people can give it their shot with the Lewis Carroll characters. And uh, you have hexes, you run around, and um, I mean, there are some figures that you can check out uh, that might be fun. I prefer the American McGee Alice in Wonderland stuff myself, even though it's very old <laughs> at this point. Um, but yeah, they are not terrible, they're neat, and if you have some people that are fans of Lewis Carroll or even the Disney version, I think maybe you'll find some enjoyable stuff in here. I just got uh, some other uh, princess-type games. What is it? Twisted Fables? I got the box here somewhere. I think it's Twisted Fables from Dimension Games. So I am set for uh, these types of things uh, in this space. But if you got a little daughter or something, then maybe you have a good time playing. So they've created a deluxe version to rock, paper, scissors, which is traditionally just played with your hands. But they will give you a rock, they will give you paper, and they will give you scissors. Um, the cost of all of these things is uh, 30 bucks, And I can't see why you would do this. There's a solo mode, so if you weren't able to play on your own, then maybe that's why you get it. Um... There's some type of uh, Cards Against Humanity tie-in from the look of it. So um, maybe that's it. I don't know. Then we have another naval-style game, piracy, that kind of stuff. Tactics are required out on the high seas. You're going to play one of two cold-blooded captains. Uh, it does not look like it's going to fund this round, but keep an eye on it if that's what you want to do. Um, yeah, so three backed, maybe they're just not used to, you know, the, the system and all that, uh, first time creator, that kind of thing. 
Uh, you can check it out on Tabletop Simulator, though, and maybe that'll change your mind, and who knows, maybe it'll turn it around and be able to fund. Then we have Winds of Baltaro, Race to Baltaro Glacier. Doesn't this look very Terry Gilliam in Time Bandits? Uh, I, I like the aesthetic as uh, far as it goes. Hopefully by the end of the month it will have funded. Um, maybe, what's that one? Uh, the Golden Compass, uh, His Dark Materials, the BBC one. It looks a little bit like it would fit there as well. Uh, neat miniatures, uh, different things that go along with it. Uh, it's just hard to say where they all fit. It's maybe like a diesel punk kind of world. Steampunk maybe. Uh, nowhere to check it out first, but uh, could be fun. Neat idea. I'm straight out of Dallas. Then we have one of those anime style magic tournament games with uh, little chippy people. Um, those kind of sell themselves with their expectation. So you got a bunch of different characters and animal things that you can be along with it. Uh, you can get yourself thrown into the game. I do not see anything to let you play it in advance, but if you are into chippy style uh, spell casting and resource collection and looking for some type of weird magic stone MacGuffins, this might be for you. Then we're on to RPG stuff. This is dungeon tiles. These are modular tiles, various types, so that you can just kind of lay them out and quickly throw a map together. So they're, I think they're eight by eight, and they just happen to fit within uh, a lot of different types of uh, scenery. So if you need something quick, get these dungeon tiles and you'll be fine. It says it's 5e compatible, but really that's just about the size for a 28 millimeter um, scale. So I think it will work for any game if you're using 28 millimeter scaled miniatures. Then we have the Fight STL. So already you got boxers, you got karate children, you've got uh, Hogan Hulksters, you've got warriors of the ultimate kind. Uh, I think that's Muhammad Ali, and uh, yeah, Tide of the Dragon. If you've already purchased it uh, for Street Masters, might have some stuff. But you know, you need yourself a Holyfield, and you need yourself a Daniel San. And you need a Conor McGregor. All these different types of fighters that I'm sure are not getting paid for the use of their likeness. Um, Cost-wise, eighteen dollars in order to pick these up. I mean, it's a neat idea, especially if you wanted to include a particular favorite in a game of yours. Dice! We haven't seen a lot of dice campaigns. Acrylic dice, if you want to pay for them, uh, you know, these are the colors. I'm going to run through it pretty quickly. Standard colors. Check them out. Looks like you can read them, so that part's good. Uh, and if you're interested in this person's stuff, check them out. Then we have a 5e setting, 100 plus pages. This is Galactic Anarchy, inspired by spacefaring, pulp magazines. In other words, Star Wars or Buck Rogers or um, the Flash, ah, Savior of the Universe, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, with Spelljammer most likely popping up at, in March or uh, early next year. Um, I think March might be the Critical Role one. Uh, then uh, something like this may pop in there. Star Foxes and all that kind of things. It looks like they're possible here. So one of those revamps using 5e rules, nothing wrong with that. Uh, Iron Kingdoms. This is another uh, expansion book that goes into that. The Privateer Press took their Iron Kingdoms game and switched it into 5e rules so that everybody could take their wonderful lore and all that kind of stuff and use it with familiar rules because it doesn't really matter um, as far as what mechanics you use as if the story is good then you'll play through it looks awesome interesting setting all that kind of cool stuff it has been vetted with uh, players for a while and really it's just making similar mechanics uh, flow together so that you can use uh, uh, you can put it in front of a bigger audience so this is just more stuff to go along with it you can get other um, uh, core books and that kind of stuff. So these guys here, this guy, Chris Handley, was on Beasts of War, which I think is now on Tabletop, and is actually the guy that, that explained Kingdom Death to me when I watched his playthrough, and we did a really good job. And I've heard him on Darker Days Radio talking about Vampire. He's got a good podcast. It's, uh, it's really engaging, and he does a really good job of being enthusiastic but clear at the same time. So thanks to that guy.
from myself if he watches this, which he won't. But <laughs> thanks to him for uh, you know in introducing me to a game I really enjoy. Then we have a triple hex dice. So if you don't want to carry around dice because they're not big enough, um, you have a much larger piece of acrylic uh, that looks kind of futuristic, but it really is just three D6s that get rolled. And as you shake them around, they'll spin and then settle into the uh, edges that are here in this hexagon. So it's a neat idea just to have something entirely different, but I cannot guarantee the... Um, actual variability and randomness of this design. Then for those of you who need to 3D print some interiors, we got the city of Oxwell 3. So if you need more, you can go to the other parts of the cities or combine other buildings, whatever it is that works for you. And uh, these are all half the size so that it makes it easy for you to get the uh, minis in and out of them uh, and, and wander them around the room. And you don't get your fingers all kind of in the way and not be able to see what's going on. So those are, are great ideas. Then you have two players in a haunted supernatural horror game taking place in a school, the Haunted Hill Academy. I think this uses the Fate system, if I remember correctly. Uh, Fate was pretty popular over the summer, had some good sales. Uh, Will Wheaton's Tabletop, I believe, has an episode on it if you wanted to check it out. And then get on your own uh, Magician's Spooky Hogwarts kind of thing going. And then for the Slayers RPG, which I am not familiar with, uh, this is the Slayers Almanac, providing settings, um, cities, other kind of information to go along with it. And um, I'm not sure if the Slayers are like slashers or if they slay the bad guys, whatever the deal is. Uh, yeah. So uh, it says, though, that you can use the districts, so the cities that they put out, in any system without much modification, so that's cool. Uh, but I think it would be more of a modern setting kind of setup. Then for Starfinder or Traveler, whatever you want, Colony 87 Wave 4, these are sci-fi civilians. So the people that load up the ships, the people that wander around the towns, the people that ride giant chickens from the look of it, uh, there's all kinds of things that you could see. So. Um, They've already, these nobles and things were part of some other thing. Uh, so they have other series that you can pick from. If you decide to pledge for any of these, you can go back and check them out. Uh, there are some, uh, some stretch goals even. So you get some more added value with your money. And if you're playing Starfinder or whatever, or even, uh, what do I got up there? I got uh, Firefly, Brown Coats and Brigands. Maybe these guys would even be uh, able to work in those kind of worlds. 3D printable Elven Lord. Not the Lord from New Zealand, but Elf Lords. Um, the ones you find in Rivendell. You get a free model. You can check out. See? Got the horns on his head and all that kind of cool stuff. So you can print it out now and see if you like it. Uh, one thing to note on the 3D printable stuff, all of the major resin manufacturers right now have uh, some form of Kickstarter going on for the big, 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 big resin printers. And any cubic has one for an extremely high detail, uh, smaller uh, system. So if you thought it was a good time to jump or you had some hesitancy, right now a lot of stuff is on sale. So you might want to look around and find what your, uh, your favorite might be. These all looked pretty cool, pretty supported, all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, they have a Patreon where you, if you like the aesthetic of this particular sculptor, you can go in and check out previous things they've created and uh, fill out your collection. More dice! Gradient colors this time, uh, acrylic dice. Um, so yeah, if they have some type of two-tone that merges into them, then uh, that might be the color you're going for. And whatever makes you feel special at your table and it makes it easy for you to recognize which die goes to what person that is for you. RPGs are for weird things, so King Tut's Rootin' Tootin' Weird West Extrava Bonanza might be the thing you need. Weird West zine for Old School Revival. Uh, old School Revival, I think, has lots of different tables, so you can just have all kinds of wacky randomness. I like Weird West stuff. Um, so throwing in weird looking aliens and old, you know, crotchety miners and 
sandworm riding and uh, ghoulish individuals. It's like Lord, Wild West Fallout uh, kind of thing happening. So if you want them freaky, if you want them weird, try to take a look here. Then if you like farming, my little farm 3D printable stuff. Uh, if you did want to go Weird West, then these would fit pretty well in there. It's just uh, trees and mills and all that kind of stuff. A little on the friendly side. So even though the world that you've created might be super dark and all that, maybe this will be, uh, unless you want to throw a lot of rust and, and rot and things in your paint job, a little haven for folks to check out. Um, there is a new movie called Lamb coming out. So if you want just hell goats and stuff like that, uh, you know where this bunny could be. He could be Mr. Fluffy, or he could be that beast that uh, the Monty Python folks are going after. Um, and, you know, beware Shakira, you know? And then uh, Bat Cow, if you want her to be. Uh, horses. Ducks. I got nothing to say about that. Pitbull, your best friend. Your little house, go along with it. I don't see Tom and Jerry, but maybe if they popped up, then Spike there can go running after him. All your favorite shrubbery and some hay lofts and, or hay bales and that kind of thing, tractors and whatnot. So whatever type of game you're doing, if you just want a, a little scene from a farm, you can date it to whatever uh, fantasy existence you want it to be. Otherwise, you know, enjoy yourself. And we have our haunt by uh, someone that's doing... It says that it's by Jamila J. Najati, but it's sold by J. Dragon. Not if they're the same person or how that part's going to work. Uh, but if you want a ghost story to play, and this is supposed to be coming out in February, so maybe you can play it for Valentine's Day. If you got that kind of spooky Morticia Adams Valentine, um, then uh, maybe you'll have some fun. So, yeah, 100 pages, about half size. Otherwise, you're going to get it through Drive Through RPG. And... Um, yeah. Oh, maybe. Okay. So if they're named Jamelia and it's a he, they, then maybe they have a short name of J. Okay. Maybe that's how it all works. It gets confusing when all the names come together and they don't match up. So I think post Apo survivors, um, you can get them in resin metal or STL, in which case you do them in whatever you want them to do in, um, are replacements for multi-part models that you can use in uh, whatever you need. So if you want them to be a fantasy football team, you use them. If you want them to be uh, NPCs terrain, then you use them. If you want them to be your player character or diorama or whatever you want to do, then you use them. So that part is cool. Uh, you have lots of different options, including these female versions of some of the characters, like mechanics. They would work great in resin, not resin, relic knights, which uh, still has yet to ship to too many people. So... Cool things, good sculpts, just see if it's what you need for what you are playing. Then we have Tales of the Smoking Worm number four for Dungeon Crawl Classics. So you can get uh, some patrons, magic, spells, all that kind of cool stuff in this magazine. Um, they are focusing on trolls, familiars, and some other cool things. Total of 60 pages, comes in color. So, yeah, if you're playing Dungeon Crawl Classics, Mutant Call Crawl Classics, or uh, even some other OSR type things, maybe you can integrate this into your world. Uh, Smoking Worm, uh, I guess this is similar to the Yawning Portal. And it's just a, a place for you to enjoy a uh, relaxing beverage with an illithid. These have popped up before in uh, various ways. The $40,000 thing, I think they were priced high before as well. It's not going to happen. Um, it's just too high a price for too niche a product. But they're dice made to look like mushrooms. So you spin them, and then whatever side is faced up on the uh, cap, then it gives you a number. But um, try as they might, they're just not as useful, not as um, uh, pervasive. Not as easy to see as polyhedral dice. So you really got to find somebody who's doing an Underdark campaign. Or maybe with the Feywild, it'll be uh, their their time to try to make it happen. Uh, I understand it's not as easy to create. And you have a lot of unique sculpts. 
so they might have to hit that number, but it might just be too high to go to market with. Space Apes, Harambo's Revenge. So if you need an ape and you need them to have guns and you want them made out of metal, then uh, send them out to combat the universe. So you got guns, machetes, uh, robot arms, snipers, all the kind of cool stuff you might think are out there in the future and add yourself in a space ape. Then we have the Tome of Spell Holding. So uh, these are just counters. Um, they're supposed to look nice. And they go into these uh, folded up magnetic books. So uh, whatever it is you're looking for, you, at least you have uh, a nice way to kind of track things. And uh, maybe re even receive enough to share with friends. I would uh, probably hit all those rims and make them all look black or shiny or some other thing. You can get uh, various chips and things to go along with it, if that's what you're into. So yeah, just some new way to have a nice thing. Then we have the spooky supplement for 5e Edmont's Harrowing Horrors. And these are coming out in January, but it's subclasses for College of Corruption. you think maybe there'd be like an anti-paladin would be more for corruption, but whatever. Uh, the Possessed Barbarian, which is interesting for Rage considering how it's like you're entering a flow, not necessarily just being angry. You can be possessed by somebody that kind of does the same thing. The Circle of Spirit Shepherds for the Druid, uh, Oath of the Undying Watch Paladin, and the Abyss Torn Sorcerer. So those might be fun. Um, and pump, Pumpkins. Not Pumpkin. Pumpkins. And some new things to throw in there. So, I don't know. Uh, Halloween theming. Kind of neat. Why not give it a shot, even though it's not going to make it in time? You like maps? You want some good ones? Then uh, Atlas, Tabletop Maps, and Encounter Cards for 5e gives you a lot of cool things. Um, I don't know what the deal is the pins. Uh, I just skip over those whenever I see them. But uh, you can see you can just lay out the stickers and things and peel them back on and off, depending on how you want it to work. And then you have Encounter Cards to help you out depending on the type of adventure you want to run. So you can uh, get yourself a little quick start and uh, enjoy your, uh, yourself out in your homebrew world. That was me, that was not you, but I'm not gonna redo it. Someone, someone felt the need to tell me that Mike Mesnick, who was part of Cards Against Humanity, bought a toiletry bag. So sometimes they just, send you these these things and it's not important what is important halloween monsters and environments if you're going to have a halloween game then you need some monsters they're not the most detailed gargoyles and walls and all that that i've ever seen but you know what they're just good enough to have a good time with and that is what's important you get some pumpkins you get some stuff and uh you go out and have a good time january though so it's going to miss halloween but it'll be just in time for the other January, February Halloween themed products when, if they all come out together. Then you have 100 maps, 20 models, 6 modules, 3 one shots. You get a lot going on here in Magnificent mop, Maps, Models, and Modules. A different, and maybe this is 4M <laughs> instead of 3M. Uh, Game of Tea uh, seems to give you this cool looking uh, pieces where the art looks pretty awesome. And uh, you have some interesting looking characters. I like this. I don't know if she's a dryad or a water elemental, a naiad, a witch, what she is. Whatever she is, she looks cool. And that's what's important there. Great sculpt. I might pick this up just for, for some of the pieces that are here. Um, if I was going to run a water adventure, these, these look really cool. So I uh, like having the sphinxes. And uh, other pieces would be great if it was like the beginning of the uh, never ending story where those two sphinxes were on the outside. So uh, let's see how much they cost. $28 gets you 20 STLs, uh, $41 gets you all the battle maps and everything else like that. So it's not a bad run. Uh, I may pick it up though, I'm thinking about it. And then the War Within RPG, this is a 1980s Cold War role play scenario um it's like this war of mine <laughs> kind of thing uh, i have played some cold war room escapes i lived through <laughs> the 80s 
Um, so I don't know how well I do put on spies like us and, uh, you know, get yourself some inspiration, uh, check out the rule book and see if you can make it, um, some different types of governments. Cause there were a lot of different, more different types of governments than, uh, there are now, uh, out there. Uh, they got rid of apartheid since then and all kinds of stuff like that in a lot of places. So, you know, the world did get better. So go back to when it was worse and, uh, try to give it your own sense of justice and accomplishment. Then if World Anvil or any of those other ones are just too digital for you, you can get the World Builders Journal and have it on paper. So this is uh, a means of having a book that hopefully will inspire you as you uh, sketch your little notes and whatnot, um, draw pictures, play in the margins, all that kind of stuff. And hopefully it will give you some ideas, ways to organize your thoughts and create the best tabletop world you can think of. So that's the World Builders Journal. And then the Seekers of the Unknown. <laughs> so maybe that's how it is instead of unknown. This is a classics mutated adventure for mutant crawl classics. We had dungeon crawl classics and then the more modern one, the futuristic one is mutant crawl, crawl classics. So uh, if you like checking it out, you want something that's a little more beer and peanuts and have a good time with some one shots and try out some new things before you jump fully into something that's more fleshed out like Starfinder. Uh, kill yourself some mutants, have a good time. Then move on to like maybe Mothership or, or Traveler uh, or don't. Just keep having a good time in this kind of world of the post-apocalypses. Then we have more dice. So uh, a free D2 is a coin. And this is supposed to have some inclusions that have little ships and things inside of them. So that's all really cool. Uh, some are glow in the dark. Um, they could be hard to read because they're very busy of what's going on. Uh, but that's up to you if you would like something that has ships in a dice instead of ships in a bottle. I can see why you would like that. Then with all those figures you've been printing out, then maybe you need some bases to go along with it. These are 150 pre-supported interesting bases from Asgard Rising. So as you can see, they've got like prisons and mushrooms and other crazy things, rocks and whatnot, uh, fish, lots of cool ideas and things like that to give some character to your characters. Uh, you got a free mini here, which is a beast man. If you wanted to print that out to yourself and uh, this ancient sword thing, is pretty neat to go along with it you have uh, stuff to hunt in the deer um stuff to forage out here in the mushrooms and stuff to hunt you in the dragons then we have a physical printing of bite-sized stories and quick encounters so uh it's just ideas you can use with anything any tabletop system that you want just concepts of uh I, you know the, was it like 10 15 adventures Oh, more than that, so maybe uh, maybe 20. Um, and it just breaks it down for you, how it would be structured in a three-act system and ways that you can reward people for uh, the fun stuff that they do and just some simple artwork and things like that. There's no reason you couldn't put this into whatever system that you want. That's what it's designed for. So if you're like, why is 5e get all the the fun? Well, there you go. You can use these in your system as well, the one you prefer. Then we have Box of Harlots, inspired by uh, one of the subtitle sub tables for the DM guide, I think. And if you need some prostitutes to talk to, here you go. You need some uh, bar wenches, that kind of thing. You get some ladies of the night of varieties uh, of whatever you're looking for. Even a couple gentlemen, if uh, you're looking for that kind of action to go with it. Uh, these people existed uh, for sure. They probably still exist. And you can use them in a lot of different ways. And I think it's a great opportunity to test your painting skills because they have lots of flowy clothing and uh, accentuated body parts that maybe you uh, will learn how to capture the light on. Then we've got more modular adventures for 5e. This is Extraordinary Expeditions. And um, you can get a free adventure just by clicking there to go along with it to test them out. And uh, the whole idea is to have quick adventures that you can try out um looks like they have up to level 10 which is when most adventures are ending 
So if you wanted to just give your guys something to look for as they wander through whatever uh, homebrew world you've got, this should be able to help you out. And if you don't know how to make your own adventures, you can just modify these um, because they're self-contained and easy to slot in. So it'll give you an, an inspiration and a concept of how to uh, follow a structure that can be self-contained or maybe even a jumping off point for a bigger narrative. Then bringing it back for another launch, this is Mortimer's Magnificent Monsters of the Multiverse. There were a lot of dinosaurs in this one, if I remember correctly, and things that were like Gojira uh, themed. So eight bucks for one monster or a PDF copy of a supplement. It's hard to say because really people are just like, just tell me how much the whole thing is and don't like piecemeal it out. Um, but they seem to want to piecemeal it out that way and try to charge a lot more. That makes it difficult uh, if you want to, you know, it's 25 bucks for four models. That might be the, the max that they have. There's like a Triceratops. Let's go up here. It's like a Triceratops, a uh, Swamp Thing, uh, some type of Spider Wolf and maybe a really early Gamora. So um, if you're interested, 25 bucks uh, with the adventures and all that, it's a bit more. I just think that it is a hard sell when it's not packaged the same way that people might expect. And if you need some help changing some monsters out to something a little more dreadful, this is Mutated Monsters making legendary creatures out of uh, the archetypes that are present in the regular game. There's decks that you can get as well to go with the book. So that makes it easier for you when you're uh, looking for a quick reference and you know trying to figure out or display to somebody like just what it is that they're looking at and you don't want to have to go fish for every book that you've got. Free samples are present with uh, four ready to play monsters, not just one. And uh, you can check it out from there. 300 bucks gets you like STLs and all kinds of crazy stuff um, you can get for just under a hundred bucks stickers and that kind of thing uh, moving your way up so lots of different options are present and uh, stuff for you to enjoy if you have the money then we have the age of Ingu iniquity the players in kid in Kyridian. that is not a word i'm familiar with so it is for uh, first edition of dungeons and dragons also what you'd find in old school revival stuff and um I don't know, it, the numbers probably don't match up, but if you are a big uh, lover of the original Dungeons & Dragons, then maybe this works for you. Um, yeah, it, it seems to be a lot of the stuff that we kind of already know, where the outer planes are, the inner planes, the way that those systems work, but new information and new cool things to go along with it to uh, help you out and maybe add some stuff that... Uh, the newer systems had now uh, the older systems hadn't quite caught up to artwork looks cool if you like the old school aesthetic and uh yeah obviously if you're looking for a 1e game then you like that old aesthetic it must be my birthday more weird west this time for pathfinder second edition and D D fifth edition so levels five and eight as your range for this um I love the idea of Weird West stuff because it just fits so well. Anything can be a spell. It's just the same mechanic of making a thing happen. And uh, why not have some cowboy goblins, you know? Then five torches deep, the high profane peaks. Uh, you can add a uh, mountainous adventure. So if you were on your way to the spine of the world or some other type of mountainous deal, you would need these 70 pages, including lineages, spells, equipment, things that you might need. Um, this is for OSR stuff, but it can be extended to 5e. Uh, it's a generic supplement uh, in that capacity. But uh, 5e has just regular classes. The other systems might have prestige classes or advanced systems, so this includes four of those new new types of classes. Goat Knight, that's an interesting way um, to have your steed set up, but it would totally work. Crab People, Radish People, maybe Golems, 
uh, all kinds of cool things to throw in there. Um, Five Torches Deep is available also in its original form at a reduced price if you wanted to check that out. And if your dice smell bad, maybe you want to switch these out for scented ones. Um, I don't know how this fragrance sticks with it. Uh, once it's in the resin, then I don't know if there's there's anything that will allow aromatics to, to come out. Um, but hey... If it works, it works. If you want something a little different, give it a go. It seems to have um, char smell, so cozy campfire. So maybe they actually smoke, add smoke to it. Oh, this tobacco thing. Don't come to my place. I'm allergic to tobacco. My throat's going to swell up if you do that. So, yeah. At least they warn you beforehand in case you have allergens. So I guess that part's cool. And then from what could be your favorite YouTuber, because it might or might not be me. I, I'm, a, I'm not an animator. I know that's got a certain appeal. Dingo Doodles, you have Fool's Gold and her partner, Felix Enric. And um, she's got a story about wakening a Tarasque by accident through karaoke. That is a fun one to watch uh, or listen to. Um, I guess the Hit Point Press has licensed out the Sundrop uh, name, so that's kind of cool. Hit Point Press, um, they had Hecna most recently. They've got Humblewood. They make the animated uh, uh, spell cards and stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Uh, and Dingo is a uh, animator, and she has some interesting things. She's got a neat voice uh, in the way that uh, she presents her stuff as this very... Um, anxiety ridden <laughs> uh person that is um got their weird monkey with that weird hand character that they run around in the world stuff so she's she's got a talent for animating for sure uh and storytelling and getting stuff on so one of the fun people like if you're listening to z bashu and those types of folks um they went through, I think, a little bit of this and like what all is to be uh, found. Sips, right here, that's her character, who is a monkey person. Um, and they got a bunch of other cool things that go along with it if you wanted to follow along with the, uh, the group and as they play. So, uh, supporter, if you want to. Hit Point Press has a pretty good track record of... Um, making sure that the people that they partner with are going to be interesting and successful and bring a different voice. So if you want this slightly anime uh, world to throw uh, at your players, then uh, check it out and maybe even get yourself a badass Tarasque. Then we have more Halloween stuff. Uh, light up minis. It says there's no wires, so I'm not sure how they do it. Um, maybe they pop in an LED and then you're supposed to throw in a battery and it's made to size to the battery. Yeah, that seems to be it. So you're just, uh, slipping in the LED and then bending the wires down. It's up to you how you want to do it. Obviously there's no off switch, so you would just be aware of that. Although the batteries, depending on which ones you get, should last for quite a while. Um, these are cool. Uh, as they say, yes, don't paint them. If you are going to print them in resin, though, uh, then you shouldn't have a problem with that. Because, uh, yeah, they're they're going to show up um, very transparent if you get the right type of resin. But not all resins will function in the same capacity or have the same opacity levels. So just be aware of that. Don't be like, oh, I'm going to just throw in any resin. Nope, it might be too opaque. And then we have the Bai Z and the Book of Monsters. So this is uh, maybe Asian inspired. Uh, maybe it's just a whole new thing with a weird font. Um, yeah. So 25 monsters, 15 page campaign. So maybe not too long. Total thing is uh, 56 pages. The seven guest creators, nobody cares about. <laughs> um, but 10 races or sub races and three subclasses are interesting things to throw in there. Um, what they were subclasses of would be more interesting as opposed to just saying the name of it and then not saying what their subclasses for. 
Uh, is there a comic book that goes with it? Yeah, maybe. Uh, show you how to play through their campaign. It's kind of a neat deal the way I go about it. Um, here they tell you a bard, a wizard, and a fighter. And then Dragonkin, I think, are already in the latest uh, Fizzbands. Nephilim, uh, I think, are Asimar. Beastkin, I think, are already in a few other things. So, yeah, maybe not the, the most original, but um, maybe it could be the weird mythological world you're looking for. And that's it. 68 campaign so far. And, uh, yeah, some looked pretty cool. I'm going to give that a second look at the one. Because I am going to be getting a new resin printer in January. And I'll finally be able to try those out um, and see stuff uh, on that end. I will probably still have four or five months of my dad's stuff going on. Um, so I might not be able to get to it right away. But it'll be there, ready for me, when uh, I've got that together. So if there was anything cool here, uh, let me know. See if there's anything you like, anything that you're in the market for, that you're looking for, you're looking forward to, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I would expect things to start getting better, I would say, in March. And at that point, hopefully, the shortages... See, because the... The shortages are, are forecasted <laughs> ahead of time when supply will be uh, ready uh, for what the things we're going to be missing out on. The chips, the, the um, food stuff, all the different things that are sitting on ships already and they can't get unloaded. Um, the, uh, they'll know, how many, you know about how many are going to arrive. There'll be uh, hopefully a bunch more vaccinated workers so that they're not going to constantly get sick like they are right now. Um, I would say March to be effective uh, and see where that goes. And apparently Mike Mesnick is uh, still out there buying stuff, and that's why I keep getting these uh, notifications. So it was me again, not you. Sorry about that. So I'm trying to sign off. You guys have a good one. Enjoy your week. And I may or may not be around on Friday. Um because I'm super busy. If I'm not in on the Fridays, then there'll just be giant 100 campaign Tuesdays, and we'll see how that goes. You guys have a good one.